السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our global audience, and welcome to our webinar today as part of the Saudi Human Capital Club activities. Today, we are going to talk about a very important and critical topic to all organizations and individuals. We talk about the people development and training. The topic we've selected for this is about the 10 generations of the field formerly called training and how training has become talent development and what that means. So in a journey today is almost 90 minutes, we will talk about how the training a practice evolved through different generations until we talk about now the talent development and what does that mean and what are the implications to the people and to the organization. This is a very important topic and therefore we have uh, our very distinguished guest for tonight. So we have a professor, Dr. Uh, William Rodwell. And Dr. William Rodwell, we feel, uh, we highly appreciate the efforts and the contributions being done by uh, experts like Mr. Rodwell in, in the industry and in the learning and development and talent development and the Sintos industry. Before we start, please allow me to introduce Mr. our speaker, Dr. Rodwell. He's the president of Rodwell and Associate. Uh, he's also professor of learning and performance in the workplace at Pennsylvania State University. He has authored, co-authored, edited, or co-edited more than 300 books book chapters, articles, including 64 books. As a consultant, he has also worked with over 50 multinational corporations, including Motorola, General Motors, Ford, and many others. He also worked in the Middle East. He also worked in the, in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and part of the GCC. Uh, Dr. Redwell also earned the Graduate Faculty Teaching Award at the Pennsylvania State University. And his Train the Trainer book has won several Global Awards. I, I highly thank Mr. Rodwell for accepting an invitation for today. And I would like to ask Mr. Rodwell to just start his presentation. So Dr. Rodwell, thank you very much for accepting the invitation and you may start. Okay. Uh, I take it you don't want me to share my screen or my, oh. Oh, you can, you, no, you can't, you can't do it. Okay, now, now it's yours. All right, so now I will turn on my slides. Can you see my slides? Oh, yes, 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 clear. Okay. All right, well, today I'd like to talk about the 10 generations of the field formerly called training. And I would add that I've spent much of my career studying the field of training and particularly the competencies required to be successful in the training function. So when we say generations, we mean different ways of thinking, different paradigms, and I like to start my sessions with an informal poll. You do not have to answer the poll, but I like to use it as a starting point to get you to reflect or to think. How many of you would call yourselves, pick one of these, trainers, training and development professionals, HRD practitioners, HPI or human performance improvement professionals or performance consultants, workplace learning and performance professionals, learning and development professionals, HR professionals, talent developers, or some other title or name for your occupation. If you are at a cocktail party, what do you tell people that you do? If you are at a party or a dinner and someone says, what is your occupation? How do you answer that question? So the point is that our field 
which used to be called training and development, has changed over the years. And it's more than just playing with words, playing with language. It represents different thinking about what our field is and what we're trying to accomplish. So I actually have quite a lot to cover in my 90 minute presentation. You know, developing human beings is as much an art as it is a science. And the field of training has gone through many shifts or paradigm shifts. And if you're familiar with the idea of a paradigm, it's basically the idea by which scientific principles advance. Scientists believed that the sun revolved around the earth. And later it was shown that that was false. And it is the opposite. The earth revolves around the sun. And that was a fundamental paradigm shift. So a, so a paradigm is a way of thinking, and that's important for our meeting today and our talk because the view is that our field has gone through ten, 10 different paradigm shifts. But I would quickly add that th this does not mean that your organization is wrong if you are in one of the earlier paradigms than the most current one. And the reason for that is that organizations have a different level of development, different levels of sophistication in how we think about developing people for their jobs. And so for that reason, it is not a question of one generation being better than another. Instead, the idea is that the generation of people development or human resource development that your organization should adopt depends on how sophisticated your managers and workers are in their thinking about the field. So here are the, here's a list of the 10 generations. You might even say there's 11. Depends on how you count them. Generation one is informal training. When I say informal training, I'm talking about unplanned on the job training follow people around to learn what they do. Generation two is very detailed, very well-planned training. Generation three, a term still widely used, human resource development. But we know that term has special meanings. Generation four is performance consulting which some people call human performance improvement, human performance technology, human performance engineering, human performance enhancement. Generation four goes by different names. Generation five, workplace learning and performance. Generation six, the workplace learner. Generation seven, learning and performance. Generation eight, social learning and social media. Generation nine, training and development again. And in generation 10, we start to move into talent development. So uh, by the time we finish this session, you should have some idea of where the field of training has advanced to and why it has gone through these different generational shifts or different paradigms, ways of thinking about the field. And we'll talk about the strategic implications 
of those different generations of the field. So every one of my webinars has an agenda. This webinar is no different. So my participants usually like to know the structure or organizational scheme of the session. Here it is, part one, we're in the introduction and I'm talking about that at the moment. Part two, the 10 generations of the field and how we think about that strategically. Part three, the implications of these generations, and then a summary and an opportunity for you to offer questions and answers. I would add that I have published many books and conducted many, any research studies on the field. And here are several of those. ASTD Models for Human Performance is a competency study of the characteristics needed to be successful in human performance improvement. And then one of the generations is workplace learning and performance. And here is the cover of the research study, the competency study that focused on that. I've published many other competency studies for ATD and you might say, well, why would we want a competency study? You must understand that many people today are very interested in ATDs certified professional in learning and performance certification. Certification programs, if they are done properly, are not made up from scratch. They are based on tough research, rigorous research on the characteristics needed to be successful in an occupation or in a job. And so I've spent much of my career doing research in cooperation with ASTD, now called ATD, around the uh, competencies of the field. And I was one of the founders of the certification pro program that ATD developed. One of the competency studies, and you can see it on your screen at the moment, was translated into Arabic. And so you can obtain that. And more recent uh, publications, 2015, I did a research study on talent development. And there were two large surveys and interviews with 32 people in many countries, including Saudi Arabia, including the Middle East, and we actually conducted the interviews in the natural language. So we interviewed Russians in Russian, Chinese in Chinese, Arabic people in Arabic, and so forth. So it was a truly field is shown by that map the talent development structure, and that map is useful to help an organization's leaders and talent development professionals to decide on what should be the scope of talent development in their own country and their own company. And the most recent competency study published by ATD just came out and you can see the cover of it on the right side of your screen, Capabilities for Talent Development, Shaping the Future of the Profession. And that was published in year 2020. And if you want to obtain it, you can get it either on Amazon or by going to the ATD website and ordering it from there. So you can obtain that research study and it gives you the most up-to-date thinking about our field. So I've also published books that have been translated into Arabic, 
and I'm about to have a new one come out, Competency-Based Human Resource Management, will be published in Arabic. So here we'll talk about the different generations of the field. This part focuses on what is a paradigm, and we've already talked a bit about that, but to give you the full background, in, in uh, 1996 and 1962, Thomas Kuhn, who was a philosopher of science, charted the history of science, and he came up with the idea of a paradigm. A paradigm means a way of thinking about something, a belief system. And he said that that is the way science advances. We come up with a way of thinking, and we call that a theory. And our way of thinking, our knowledge depends our, our proof of or falsification of the theory. A theory is no good if you can only prove it. You have to also be able to disprove it. So paradigm in the history of science progresses through a way of thinking. So here's a list of one way to think about our field, I've already listed this, and you could, if you've got your cell phone and you want this right away, now's the time to take a picture of it. Uh, and these are the different levels of, or generations or paradigms of the field. And all of these exist today in different companies. So it's not a question of one is outdated. It's a question of which one is best suited to your company. So I'm gonna move through and explain each of these generations and exactly what they mean. And as I do that, I'd like you to be thinking about your own company or your own government ministry and what do you think is the best generation for your particular organization? So generation number one is informal training. I have to tell you the vast majority of all companies in the world are in this generation and they have not advanced any further. Informal training is what is used in small business, in a family, small family business. This is how we train our workers. In this generation, the organizations and its leaders really haven't thought about how to plan for systematic training. They do it informally. They hire someone and then they try to figure out how do we train that person to be productive? So in Western countries, we joke about this kind of training. We call it follow Joe around the plant or sit by Nelly. That means follow an experienced worker around to see what they do or sit next to an experienced worker and shadow them and see how they perform to learn their job. This approach to training is very bad, but it's about all you can do if you are a small company and you don't know any better. And that is why this approach is widely used. Training is managed like a consumer good, the way we would buy chewing gum or a candy bar we tend to make impulse purchases of training when times are good. I'll give you a quick example. Right now, there are many training programs being sold on the web about how your company can deal with, the, with getting work out of your workers at a time when the virus, the COVID-19 virus, makes that very difficult. 
So training of this kind tends to be very focused on recent events or business fads. Most organizations in the world are still using this approach. And I'd ask, are any of your companies using this? In generation two, we start to plan and manage training systematically. And we focus on training individuals to give them the knowledge, skill, and attitudes they need to be productive in their jobs. And the competency studies that we do make it clear that these generations exist. So there's no competency study for generation one, but there are competency studies for generation two, and we know this generation existed because there were very good research studies done in year 1978 and in 1983 focused on training and development and the competencies needed by a people who are trainers to be competent and effective in their jobs. Good training is typically based on a model. Still the most famous model is the instructional systems design model. Another name for that is the ADDIE model, A-D-D-I-E. ADDIE is an acronym that's based on the words analyze, design, develop, implement, and evaluate. Uh, the ISD model was invented by the US military to train troops. And the wonderful thing about the military is that they don't care about return on investment. They only care, does it work? And if it works, they use it. The ADDI model works. Since then, there have been other models that have been developed. Most recently, the SAM model, the successive approximation model of training, which is really based on the idea of pilot testing, training, multiple pilot tests. But does your company use the ISD model? Do you know? This is what it looks like, and there are about 200 published versions of the model and you can get a PhD degree in just this model. That's how complicated it is to build rigorous training, not training based on outlining a book and then teaching people the outline. That's not good training. Training is based on studying the work requirements and then building instruction to teach people how to do their jobs more effectively. So in this model, it starts at the top left with determining projects appropriate for instructional design. What that means is performance analysis. And basically the question is, is the problem one that can be solved by training or does the problem need a different solution? So that's a very famous question. Do we solve the problem with training or do we solve it with some other solution? Training is a solution. It will not fix all problems with human performance. In fact, the research shows it'll only solve about 10% of company problems. The other 90% require other solutions. So we only use this model if we're in the 10% of problems that can be solved by training. So the first step is decide whether it can be, training can solve the problem. If it cannot, then we don't use this model. We have to use a, another or different model. But if training can solve the problem, 
Then we work through all the steps of this model. We conduct a needs assessment to get very clear on exactly what people need to know to do their job. We study the characteristics of the learners, the people who will participate in the training. We look at the relevant work setting characteristics. Where are they going to perform? What's the work environment like? We have to study the work that they perform so that we can teach them how to do it. Then based on the needs assessment, we write performance objectives. And when people complete the performance objectives, they can do the job. Then we develop performance measurements. A performance measurement would be like a test item. Tests, you know, can be done in two ways. Written tests to test knowledge and performance tests to test whether the person can do the job. Then we have to sequence the performance objectives. What's the order that we need to teach the subject? And it makes a difference. It's some things are easier to learn when they're presented in the right order. Then we have to decide how we will deliver the training. What kind of media will we use? Will we use classroom, video, online learning, blended combinations? There are many different media that we could use to deliver the training. Some of it is more effective than others for certain kinds of performance objectives. Then we could decide whether to make, buy, or buy and modify the training materials. And then we evaluate the instruction to figure out if people can actually perform the job once they have participated in the training. This is a famous example of the ISD model, the ADDIE model, but this is more complicated than ADDIE. It's broken out all the components. Let's move on to generation three. Generation three still exists in many companies and it was defined in research as the integrated use of training organization development and career development. Why would you put those three things, training, organization development, and career development together? Why link them? Well, the answer is that training is a change effort that gives people the knowledge, skill, and attitude they need to do their present job. Career development gets people ready for the next job, promotions or job movements into other occupations. Uh, and organization development is about changing the company and its corporate culture, not just changing individuals through training. So organization development is all about large company-wide change. When we say corporate culture change, organization development is the field that first coined that term of corporate culture. So when we put those three together, we get human resource development, and we know that generation existed because there was a four volume research study, a competency study conducted of human resource development. It's still in print, it's still widely looked at. And so it's not a question of it being out of date. It's a question of what is most relevant to your company. Organizations in this generation emphasize a broader range of activities to change human beings than training alone. And that's important to understand. 
the field has generally broadened or gotten bigger over time. And that makes it more difficult for practitioners in order to have the full scope of abilities to deal with all of the elements of the field. So that brings us to generation four, performance consulting, or it goes by other names like human performance improvement. You need to know those other names because if you ever do a keyword search on the internet by going to Google, you better know those keywords because if you don't, you will miss a lot of good information. So if you're trying to do a keyword search in a browser, you need to know to use terms like human performance improvement, human performance consulting, human performance technology, human performance engineering, and there's different material under each keyword. In HPI, it's the process of identifying why people are not performing their jobs properly. Remember, I just said that in the ISD model, we have to conduct performance analysis, and the world is divided in performance analysis into two categories. One category are problems that training can solve, and the other category are problems that we use management action to solve. Well, management action is huge. Management controls everything except what is in your head, and that's the training component. Everything else, the way your job is defined, how the company chooses to hire people, who the company recruits, how the company pays you, how the company promotes you, all of those are other solutions apart from training. Training is a solution. In human performance improvement, our goal is to look for solving the problem. So a performance consultant approaches problems with human performance the way a medical doctor promotes problems with your body, with your health. And we know doctors have an approach that they use when you go to see them and you are in pain. First thing, the doctor asks you a lot of questions. When did the pain start? How severe is the pain? Where exactly does it hurt? And a hundred other questions. And then the second thing that the doctor does is perform a physical exam. Take off your shirt, jump up on the examining table, and the doctor starts poking you to find out where the pain is. If that's not adequate to diagnose the problem, then the doctor sends you to the hospital for tests, MRIs, x-ray exams, stool samples, urine samples. All of those are needed to try to identify why you have the problem and why you have the pain. Well, we use a diagnostic approach to find out the root cause of human problems. How many human performance problems are there? Well, let me tell you this, the number is so big, you cannot type it into a calculator except as a power of another number. It's actually 365 factorial. That's a number so big, it's like 36 to the 20th power. It's a huge number. Think about how many ways the human body could go wrong. Well, how many ways could job performance go wrong? It's the same kind of huge problem. 
So in HPI, we're interested in not conducting training. We're interested in solving performance problems. Managers don't want people trained if they can avoid it. They want the solution to the problem. And that's what we try to give them in performance consulting. I've published many books on this topic and done training all over the world on performance consulting. We use any or all means to solve problems once we know what are the root causes. So we can train anyone in the principles of performance consulting. The CEO can be a performance consultant. The janitor can be a performance consultant. A trainer can be a performance consultant. An HR person can be a trainer can be a performance consultant. So it does not require a college degree, it just requires the specialized training based on a competency model. And here is the competency model. So this is still up to date. Uh, the actually, the field has not changed that much because human beings have not changed that much over the last 10,000 years. So it's not like technology that changes all the time. With human beings, they pretty much stay the same. So I'd like you to pause for a moment. Think about what generations have we covered so far. We'll see if you were paying attention. We don't have to do that activity, but I just want you to stop a moment, pause and reflect, and think about what did we just look at, because we're moving into generation five. Workplace learning and performance. The formal definition comes from uh, my research study in 1999. It was defined as the integrated use of learning and other interventions for the purpose of improving human performance and addressing organizational needs. So this is not just about training. This is about getting job performance and company performance to improve. And so that's a shift in paradigm. So another way to think about it is, Workplace learning and performance reinvents human resource development in light of human performance improvement or performance consulting. So remember, HRD was only three solutions, training, OD, and career development. HPI was a billion solutions, all based on the 365 factorial root causes of human performance problems and their solutions. So we rethink what we're doing based on what tools and knowledge is available to us. Workplace learning and performance emphasizes learning See, the difference in English between learning and training is that in training, we do that to the worker. But in learning, the worker has to take that responsibility themselves. They have to take responsibility for learning. That's a shift in paradigm. Who's responsible for learning or for training? And that's a key difference. When we call it workplace learning, that means we're putting the emphasis on the worker, the learner. So workplace learning and performance includes more ways of developing people than training alone. We come up with other approaches, action learning, uh, rotation programs, job assignments, online learning, and thousands of others. Somebody published a book, The Encyclopedia of Management Development, 
And in that book, they listed 548 ways we could train someone. So it's not just send them to a classroom. There are many other ways to promote learning. Unlike training, which is done to people, learning is something that people do on their own. That's pretty important to understand, that shift. You know, I was not always a professor or a consultant. When I was a training director in a big multinational company, an insurance company, we used to put our workers through an onboarding course where we taught them how to ask questions when they were in the probationary period. Why did we do that? Because we were a little reluctant, they're a little embarrassed to ask their boss for uh, training and learning and coaching. And so we taught them how to do that and then told them that the company expected that. You see, what we were doing was priming them or encouraging them to be better learners on the job. So school does not teach that very effectively. So companies need to get better at teaching workers how to take responsibility for their own learning rather than depend on their teachers, their professors, or their bosses for that. So here's a picture, I showed you this earlier, of my competency study that describes the characteristics of the ideal workplace learning and performance pr practitioner, the person doing it. We used to call them trainers. In this generation, we call them workplace learning and performance professionals. So in generation six, we move into learning agility. Some of you have heard Professor, that term. Professor Rodio, can we pause for a minute, please? Sure. We are almost half of the uh, generations, and I have many good questions that would be good for me to pose and maybe come back to the questions if you don't mind. Okay. Okay, so uh, the first question right. is someone is asking about the competency framework. To what generation does it belong? Which one? There's a competency study for every one of these generations except for informal learning. There's a competency study for each one. So the company has to determine which generation they are best suited for. And I think that will take us to the second question. Uh, you call them generations. Are they linked to respective times? Like no, that refers to, they developed over the years. So. Uh, generations implies some are older than others, and that is accurate. Human resource development, for example, was the term we used in the 1980s and 90s. But today, we rarely use the term human resource development. So generation implies age. Okay, good. Uh, another question may be related to the generation is a question asking about the involvement of the uh, online training that we see, especially in these days. Would you consider this a new generation? No. The online. Because we can apply any one of these generations and use online learning as a media. Online learning is a medium or a channel. Television is a channel. Classroom is a channel. Online learning is a channel. And so there are different channels, or we call those media, by which to deliver the training. So it's not a generation. 
it is a mode of delivery. Good. Um, you mentioned at the beginning that the training can only solve 10% of the problems. Yes. And um, can you clarify this? Well, uh, it's a question of did we have, there are many, human beings are very complicated. And so knowledge, is, it's knowledge, skill, and ability are the only things that training can give us. But if we hire someone who, if we hire the wrong person for the job, then the mistake is not solved by training, it's solved by improving our hiring methods. So, there are different solutions that can be solved by better recruitment, better employee selection, better uh, compensation programs, better performance review and feedback systems. So if there are 365 factorial causes of human performance problems, there are that many solutions. Training is just one solution. And I think also this is linked to the 70-20-10 model, actually, about this one. Where well, but that's too, too limited, yeah. too, yeah. because we can change some performance problems simply by hiring different people. For example, if we want a good engineer, would you hire an engineer fresh out of the university or would you hire someone with 20 years of work experience in your industry in engineering? You see my point? Exactly. Experience is going to be more valuable. But uh, when talking about the HPI model, the human performance improvement, then a question came, who conducts that that analysis? Uh, you know, is it the HR or is it the line manager? Because some people are saying that if it's done by the line manager, there might be conflict. There might be part of the problem of the performance. So who, who does the HPI uh, performance improvement analysis? Anyone can do HPI if they're trained, but it works well if we use collaborative approaches where both HR and line managers work together to do it. When I was in business, we trained our line managers to diagnose their own performance problems, and they would only come to me when the problem was too difficult. They couldn't figure out what the right diagnosis was. So that actually was a very effective approach train the managers how to do it, but the ones that they couldn't solve, they came to HR for help. I was in HR. The last question before we move forward to the uh, generation six is, uh, after COVID-19, how do you envision the field of training? For example, no more classroom, that's what people, some people think, more use of the AI, artificial intelligence, and VR visual reality uh, technology. So how do you envision the future of training? Yeah, I think online and virtual methods, not just, not just online in the sense of a sophisticated learning management system, but I think virtual methods, including virtual worlds, and I don't know if that's a term that your listeners are familiar with, but if you have never been to Second Life, that's a website, you should try it out. Website, uh, Second Life allows you to act in a virtual world. I think a lot of training will move to virtual worlds. Right. Where, we, where we simulate reality, but we're online. Right. I think we are all excited to go to generation six and forward. So all right. we'll come back to the, to the second part of the question. So you may okay. forward. Generation six, some people have heard of 
learning agility. And that's what we're talking about in generation six. And this generation is not uh, all worked out, it's emerging like these later generations. It focuses on how people change by managing their own learning, not through training alone. So learning is how people develop their performance and it's something people have to learn to take responsibility for. Learning helps individuals maintain employment because all human knowledge now is dated very quickly. And going to school is not enough to keep people's skills current. They have to take responsibility for improving their own skills. So the focus on the learner is a new role and it moves past the trainer being someone who presents information and turns the trainer into a facilitator. And there's a lot of evidence that the trainer is becoming a facilitator, a questioner. And rather than give people the answer, the facilitator merely poses the questions. And it's up to the learner to do the investigation, to answer those questions. So in generation six, we've seen the emergence or the development of a new type of learner, a free agent learner. These are people who will go through 10,000 websites very quickly to find the answer to a question. They are very competent learners and they know how to speed up their learning process. So, I wrote a book and did, I spent $200,000 of my own personal funds to build a competency model for learners, not for trainers, not for teachers, but for learners. And I think this is where the future is after the virus. More and more online learning means the learner has to take responsibility for their own learning. So we also have to consider different groups that the training department has to um, please or satisfy. One of those groups is the CEO. The problem is we have not done much research in companies with what the CEO expects out of the training division. And often there is many levels of, of the organization chart between the training director or the chief learning officer and the CEO. So my research, we, we um, interviewed 78 CEOs from very large companies and we ask them, based on the ASTD competency studies, what did they expect of trainers? And we were very uh, unhappy with the results. CEOs know very little about human development and learning and development. And so this is why the training division is often the first one cut when times are bad, because the CEOs don't know what to expect out of the training division. And unfortunately, a lot of training divisions are regarded as employee welfare uh, departments, where we just make people feel good by playing adult games with them, video games, or simulations, CEOs look at those games and think that we're just playing around and that it's not useful for business purposes. And therefore, when the company falls on hard times, the first department cut is training. 
we've, we've got to open a dialogue and talk to our CEOs. So this particular book was translated into Chinese and into Russian because people in those countries were worried about what the CEO believes is appropriate for the training division. And how do we get the CEO to more clearly understand it? So what do all these generations mean so far? Let me just stop for a moment and reflect on what I've been telling you. The field has continually broadened. So it started out with a focus on training. And today we've taken in learning, we've taken in organization development, career development, training, performance consulting, all problems that have to do with the inability of workers to do their jobs and the solutions to those problems. So that means that we must really be expert at dealing with human systems. And unfortunately, about three-fourths of all trainers are promoted from within their companies and they do not have an adequate background in the field of human learning. And this is why there is such interest in certification programs like the one that ATD runs in the US or the one that the lead body has in the UK or the one that the Canadians have developed or the one the Australians have developed, or the ones in Hong Kong that the Chinese in Hong Kong have developed. But to my knowledge, none of those certifications have existed in the Middle East developed to deal with the culture resident there. So you have to consider local conditions as well. So the field has continued to broaden. That's been a common theme over the years. And we focused increasingly on the relationship between the workplace conditions and what it takes for human beings to learn in order to be more productive. So development has taken the place of training and a term we used to throw around all the time, we'd say training and development. Well, training is very clear. We all know what that is. But development is not so clear. How do you develop someone? And that's where the 70-20-10 rule first emerged, was talking about development. Training is, formal training is just part of development, but there are other big ways to learn. One is from job-based learning, where we give you work assignments to learn, and you learn from those and the experience you get from them, and also from peer learning, peer coaching, and social media, you learn by watching other people. So we'll have more to say about that in a moment. But development is more than just training. So we have increased sensitivity to all the different ways we could encourage people to learn. In 2004, the ASTD published the competency study at that time and the focus there was not workplace learning and performance, but learning and performance. So we dropped the workplace component from the name of the field, and we included other ways to learn like informal learning and incidental learning. If you're not familiar with incidental learning, it basically means accidental learning. If, if you set out to learn something, you may learn other things by accident along the way. That's incidental learning. So 
we've done many of these studies in the in the year in the workplace learning and performance study we map the entire field as including these nine areas of specialization what we call the nine areas of expertise and i've written a book or at least one book on every one of these areas of expertise. I'm probably the only living person that has done that. So learning design is one area that some people call that instructional design. In recent years, we've even called that learning experience design, which is bigger than instructional design. Uh, HPI is a whole category of its own. Training delivery means the choice of media. How do we deliver the training? Measuring and evaluating. Well, metrics are important. How do we know what performance we want? And how do we evaluate the training? Facilitating organizational change. That's where organization development resides. Managing the learning function. How do we strategically align training to business needs? That's what that's about. Coaching, which has emerged as a major area in its own right. Managing knowledge, knowledge management as an area itself and career planning and talent management all emerged. Some of you have seen this model from a ATD that is somewhat old now, but it's still used by some organizations. And it shows the different requirements to be successful for someone in our field. The idea is that you should not have to do everything on this chart. It, it depends on your company. And it depends on the needs of your company as to how many of these we, we do. And that you'll notice that there are foundational competencies at the bottom, the areas of specialization in the middle, and at the top are the basic roles. A role is not a job title. A role refers to the part you play. So one person could play many roles. As an example, to my daughter, I'm a father. To my students at the university, I am a professor. To my wife, I am a husband. Those are roles that I play, and it's the same logic here. Roles refer to the parts you play and the behaviors that those roles lead people to expect. So social learning and social media has also emerged because of the popularity of things like LinkedIn and Plaxo and Facebook and YouTube. Those are all example, Twitter. Those are all examples of social media. And we can learn from those by posting questions and we can get many answers to practical questions very quickly through social media. Social learning basically means we watch by, we learn by watching and imitating. So a good way to think about social learning is monkey see, monkey do learning. You know, a monkey will watch something and then it will try to imitate it. Well, that's social learning. And if you want to learn, let's say you want to learn how to run a business meeting. Well, you would identify a manager who's good at running meetings. And then you would go to the meeting and you would watch how that manager ran the meeting and you would take notes not on what the manager says, but on what the manager does. And then you would take that back to your own meeting and you would try to imitate what you had seen 
that manager do in the in running the meeting that's social learning and it's very powerful that's how most managers learn to manage they don't learn it in business school they learn it by watching at their bosses and then trying to imitate of course if their bosses are bad bosses then they're going to imitate badly and that's one of the challenges with that kind of learning. Now here's generation nine, and this is the generation that was just replaced by the newest published competency study from ATD. And some of you remember this Pentagon model and the competency study shown on the slide is the one that was translated into Arabic. And so again, we have called the field training and development, which is kind of old school. And we've identified the different specialty areas within the field, performance improvement, instructional design, training delivery. What's new on this particular model is learning technologies. And there, there was some feeling at the time that we needed to acknowledge all of the new media that have emerged that can be used for training purposes or encouraging human learning. So the newest model is talent development. You have to understand talent development is still somewhat a term in search of a meaning. I actually did a research study to define the word talent. And the first, and I have to tell you the truth, the first time I heard someone use the word talent, I burst in. I said, what are we now, talent scouts? Are we talent agents like in Hollywood? Is that what our field has turned into? But the reality is that talent is important because talent refers to what people are good at. What are you good at? Do you know? I challenge my PhD students all the time with that question. What are you good at? And if you don't know your core competency, if you don't know your competitive advantage, or you don't have one, then you are in deep trouble to compete for jobs, for promotions, for anything else. You have to know your strengths. What are you good at? And if you say to me, well, I'm not good at anything, then you probably need to read that book, The Outlier, which says that if you study something for 10,000 hours, you will be a world-class expert. 10,000 hours of practice on anything, and you will, be a, you will have a competitive edge. So what do you want to be an expert on? is another question. The only mistake is to not know your strength. So my students will often say to me, well, professor, what is your strength? And I point to the fact that I've published 113 books. So don't you think my strength is writing skill? And, and those books were all about human resource issues. So you can imagine I've spent more than 10,000 hours studying HR issues. So the point is talent actually has many meanings, but generally the one that is popular is we say talent means identifying what you are good at and building on it. That's the critical thing. But there are other ways to 
interpret talent. Talent could mean job performance. Talent could mean promotion capability. Talent could mean both promotion capability and performance. Talent could mean specialized knowledge that you know better than others. Talent could mean uh, special social relationships. You know our key customers, our key suppliers, our government regulators, or our family knows those people. Those could all be talent. And we care about talent because it leads to success. So talent can be a term in search of a meaning. What does it mean to you? And it has different meanings based on what the company needs. So there's no pure, perfect definition. It relates to what is the most important meaning of talent for your company? That's the critical thing to know. So we build a model of talent development and this came out in year 2015. And this particular model allows a talent development professional inside a company to identify the areas that they want their talent development department to focus on. And that way we can engage our senior executives, our our CEO and our other senior leaders and get them involved in identifying what areas should our training or talent department focus on. We can't do all of this. So which ones should we get rid of and which ones should we focus on? Now our research showed that the dark red was the core of the field that most talent development departments focused on. But that does not mean that the orange ones are not important. In your company, maybe the orange ones are the red and the red ones shown on this model are the orange. You have to customize your talent development department and its functions based on your company's needs. That's the critical thing to understand about talent development. So the current model that ATD is using is found in this book that just came out, Capabilities for Talent Development, Shaping the Future. And if you go to the ATD website, you can get a lot more information about the model on the right, which is the new model the for uh, talent development. And uh, you have to drill down in each of those bubbles. A bubble is like developing personal capability or building learner capability or impacting organizational capability. Those are the three bubbles. And when you go to the bubble, you click on it on the web and it enlarges and it shows the key areas within each of those bubbles. So that's the newest model of this field. So basically I have given you quite a lot of material and quite a lot to think about in my short presentation. Let me summarize and then we can go to Q&A. So at this point, you should be able to tell me what has happened to the field we used to call training. Well, it still exists. There are still, most companies are still small businesses and they are still in generation one, informal training. That's the bulk of the world. And only those most sophisticated organizations have reached the talent development stage. We talked about 10 generations of the field, and we talked about the idea of paradigms or ways of thinking. So each of these ways of thinking 
changes the role of the trainer, changes the role of the learner, changes the role of the company. Every one of those is a little different depending on the generation that we select. So that's important to understand. We reviewed the strategic implications of each generation. We talked about why they're important and what are their key points of focus. So I've tried to give you quite a lot of information in this short session, and I'll ask for any final questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Radwal. That was very informative and taking us through the journey of the of the learning and how it's evolved through the different generation till we come to the area of development. I'll start with the last thing that you mentioned about the ATD uh, capability model. Um, I know that you, you've been working with ATD for years. You probably are one of their consultants. You are also CPLP uh, fellow. I'm only CPLP. Uh, so I, I know the CPLP. CPLP fellow means that I'm in the Hall of Fame yeah. because I was one of the creators of the CPLP. There were two people that created the CPLP, and I'm one of the two. And I think that was back in 2000, was it 12 or something? 2004. Okay, that's good. Uh, so I'm sure you've been part of the movement from the ATD to move from the, the uh, the legacy competency model with 10 area of expertise to the capability model that have been uh, launched this year. So yes. what, are, what are the implications of moving from the competency model to the capability model of the ATD? Well, first of all, the feeling is that the word competency has been a source of a lot of confusion. And I found this to be true also in my own consulting experience, when I use the word competency, that can very often be a showstopper. It will, managers are confused by the word competency. So they'll say, well, what does that mean? And they have trouble understanding that a competency, a job description describes the job. A competency model describes the human being who does the job well. A capability model implies the potential for human growth. So capability is a way of speaking about human potential. So performance is what we do. Potential is the possibility of what we could do. So capability implies growth and the capability for growth. That's why we use that term. So now we're becoming more future oriented in the capability model. So what people can do That's in the future rather than what they are capable of doing right now. Well, and we have to do that because the world is changing so fast. In fact, have you heard this new phrase that has become popular all of a sudden, a black swan event? Have you heard that term? Oh, yeah. A black swan event. It means that something that looks small and unimportant could turn into something that would change the world. And a good example was the virus. Um, as recently as three months ago, no one was talking about the virus. And today, most of the world is shut down because of the virus, and we have to pay attention to it because it is changing the face of the world's economy. So that's a black swan event, and how many others could come along soon and change things. Years ago, the, one of the first black swan events was 
at the time, it just looked like two airplanes crashing into a building. But it turned out that that had global implications within 24 hours. And it prompted two wars. Good. Um, so, quick. Okay, uh, I have a question. You mentioned in, the, in one of your books, you talked about 500 ways of learning activities. Yeah. W which book was that? I said that there was a book. I didn't okay. publish it. So it's not your book. Okay. A book okay. entitled The Encyclopedia of Management Development lists 548 ways that we could develop human beings. Examples would be action learning, rotation programs, uh, you know, mentoring, shadow experiences, 548 of those. Um, a question about uh, work, uh, workplace learning, you're talking about performance. And the question say, how can we build a culture of self-learning within the organization? How do we build a culture of self-learning? Is that the yeah. question? Yes. Yeah, that's it, it starts by teaching the, well, in my research, I found two things we had to pay attention to, to do that. The first thing was the corporate culture. And the second thing was the individual. So the corporate culture, refer, I asked the question in my research, what does your company do to encourage you or discourage you from learning every day to solve job-related problems? And from that question, I came up with 26 factors of what the company could do to encourage or discourage workers from taking responsibility for their own learning. So the corporate co culture is one thing. The other thing is the individual's learning ability. And you know, they don't teach children how to learn in school. They teach children subjects. They teach you history or mathematics, but we aren't taught how to learn. And yet increasingly our livelihoods, our jobs depend on the speed and quality of our learning ability. So that's what we call a meta competency. Meta means it stands above job related competencies like management competence. So workplace learning is a meta competency. Um, I have a question. It's about the question says, how will the IR Industrial Revolution 4.0 help talent development? Do you expect a human being to disappear and a robot maybe will give the same presentation that you're giving now? So, would you see the future of the learning? I mean, and many people are worried I think about that, Yeah, series. I think that there is a concern that in time, uh, artificial intelligence in robots could take over. And we've seen the research that says that 40% of the entire employed population of the world could be rendered obsolete by artificial intelligence. So, but what, even in AI, one of the problems is that machines are limited by their own logic. So we have not been able to teach machines, at least so far, how to be creative. So the very last element that human beings will have that's superior to machines and robots will be the creative ability. So could a machine give my talk today? I don't think so because there is a creative component. Could, 
could a machine take somebody else's material and adapt it? Yes. Could they add a value added based on creative thinking? No, not at this stage. Maybe someday, maybe someday. And when that day comes, we better have guaranteed income from our governments. That's been discussed in the US and right now it's come up because of the virus. The government should pay everyone a certain amount of money simply to avoid social upheaval and revolutions. So we should not worry as workplace uh, learning professionals and trainers about, at least in the near future, about our jobs. I mean, it will be there at least for a while. It's, it's not going to be a concern for the next five years, but the virus will give us plenty of concerns. We better deal with that problem right now. Uh, one question before we move to the last comment, we'd like to, uh, the question is say, how, how would you evaluate knowledge sharing practices in terms of their contribution to the talent development and the organizational learning overall? I think it's critical. I wrote a book called Invaluable Knowledge. Invaluable Knowledge, it's about uh, what I call technical succession planning and technical talent management, which is about how we share special knowledge with other people. And when we lose an engineer, let's say, who's got 30 years of company experience to retirement, we can hire a young engineer from a university, but that young engineer doesn't have in their heads the result of the work experience that that retiring engineer has had. And that's very valuable. So how do we preserve it and transfer that knowledge? Yes, that's very much a part of talent management. And in the area that was listed as knowledge management in the workplace learning and performance uh, generation, that's where that would fit. So yes, that is very much a factor. Uh, in the last two minutes, Dr. Radio, uh, you, you've, been, you've been in the region, so you know the Middle East, you've been in Saudi Arabia, and probably you work with some of the organizations and maybe some of the government. How did you see the practices of the learning in the region? And we have a very dynamic society and growing economy and lots of things happening in this region. So how do you evaluate from your experience and what are your recommendations to the learning and development professionals and talent development professionals in Saudi Arabia and in the Middle East in general? I think the Middle East needs to think about, the whole region needs to think about developing its own certification effort. You know, I helped the people in the Philippines develop their own certification for training and development. Why did I do that? Because they felt that the ATD model was too U.S. centric and it worked for the U.S. labor market, which is very big and very sophisticated, but maybe it didn't work so well for their local conditions. And it may be the same problem in the Middle East. Maybe you need to build your own system of qualifications. Certainly the British did that. The Australians did that. The Canadians did that. The Filipinos did that. The Hong Kong people did that. The Chinese have not done that. And training and development in China, I think, is not as far advanced as it could be if they had been more thoughtful. So in the Middle East, I think you have two tiers. One tier is very sophisticated practices in the local branches of multinational companies 
you know, Aramco is on the cutting edge. But many of your local family owned companies are in generation one. And so if you want to advance, you need to, you need to move those sm small businesses into more sophisticated practices over time, over time. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Radwal. Thank you for being a guest speaker today at the, eight, at the uh, Saudi Human Capital Club uh, webinar. Thank you very much for sharing your very valuable ideas. It's a big topic and I really apologize for the many questions we're not able to cover, but I hope that we cover them through the presentation. And it's a recorded session and will be available for the people who want to watch it again. Uh, also, we will share the slides. Uh, Professor Ridder, can you move to the last slide, your presentation? So if you want to just reach out to Professor Ridwell, I mean, uh, I think we have her. Uh, okay, yes. So uh, this is the email, uh, and it's been very helpful uh, as usual, and I used to meet Dr. Ridwell every year at the ATD conference, and thank you very much. This year it's virtual conference, so but at least that we have you here for the uh, Saudi HR community. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for all the people who attended our session today and hopefully we'll see you in the next event. Thank you very much, Professor Rudwell. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Have a good day. Okay, bye. <laughs>